Hey, what's going on everybody? This is Jacob Soberoff for NPR Sunday Soapbox in Los Angeles. Despite record turnout in the 2008 primary election cycle, American voter turnout is not good. In fact, if we got a letter grade for voter participation in the United States, we get an F because we rank in the bottom 20% of all countries in the entire world. Usually when election reforms are discussed that would change that, they're talked about on a federal or state or local level. But superdelegates, the Democratic Party leaders and elected officials with votes in the nominating process not tied to the popular vote whatsoever, are changing that. Because it's such a tight race, there are lots of folks from the New York Times to a crowdsourced effort called the Superdelegate Transparency Project watching superdelegates very closely. Even some of the higher-ups in the Democratic Party are now looking inwards at the way they select their own party's nominee. Let me play a clip for you of Al Gore who talked last week to Terry Gross on Fresh Air. Al Gore is an uncommitted superdelegate himself. Because there's, the superdelegates have so much power in this current <laughs> primary, some Democrats think that the superdelegate system should be abandoned after this election and have it be more of a direct vote. What do you think? Uh, I probably it should be reexamined, but... I, I, I prefer to wait till this is over and get a full picture of how it has worked. I think it's premature to... Uh, I, I guess there's widespread dissatisfaction with the whole idea of having so many so-called superdelegates, but... Uh, and, and maybe that uh, will be the prevailing view when this cycle is over, but I'd, I'd prefer to wait and see. Tad Devine was Al Gore's chief campaign consultant in 2000, and when the superdelegate system was created, he had his hand in shaping the system. In February, I had a chance to go to Tad Devine's office in Washington, D.C., and ask him if he thinks that the superdelegate system that he helped create is undemocratic today, and what we should do about it. Take a listen. Can you talk a little bit about the discrepancy between the role of superdelegates as they're playing out today and as they were intended originally? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, when superdelegates were created in, by the Hunt Commission, right. uh, you know, it was contemplated that they be essentially free of the burden of having to make a public declaration of support. Okay, And, and uh, right now there's a debate going on, should they reflect the will of the people who voted in the state or are they free to do what they want? I think it's pretty clear if you look at the history of their creation, they're free to do what they want. Now, having said that, that wasn't the only reason they were created. They were created, in my view, and if you look at the, you know, the technical advisory committee testimony and the proceedings of those early commissions, you'll see that a number of things were contemplated in their creation. And certainly, a number of reasons why they should stay in place occurred by what happened in the years that followed. First, you know, to provide that independent source of judgment. Second, to provide some kind of backstop, you know, I mean, you know, sometimes in a nominating process, you could have a nominee, for example, who did very well early on, who became the putative nominee of the party, and then suddenly a huge scandal of votes. We're sure on the Republican side, you know, today, I see there's a scandal involving their putative nominee. So, you know, the Democratic Party wanted a mechanism to say, listen, if something happens in this long process, which happened over the course of many, many months, perhaps we need a mechanism to say, wait a second, this person who won early really shouldn't be the nominee of our party. And finally, uh, there was a belief that we needed some mechanism for closure. You know, that if a, two, a couple of candidates competed early, n someone got ahead, but not too far ahead, that we'd have a mechanism where people could move towards that nominee. And, and, and remarkably now, I mean, this, uh, you know, people, I say this today, no one believes it, they, they just can't, you know, think it's true. At the time when they were created, it was felt that these elected officials, members of Congress, other party insiders, if they were made delegates, it would actually make the convention more representative. And I know I read this on blogs, and people say, that's ridiculous, I dismiss it on its face. Well, the fact is that the reforms of the 70s were producing delegates who were very, very much activists within the party. And if you looked at those delegates and you looked at the floor of those conventions, it wasn't necessarily the mainstream right-center part of the Democratic Party. It was very much the left and far left of the Democratic Party. So for all these reasons, we created superdelegates, and at different points in time, they played different roles. Superdelegates are technically unpledged, mm -hmm. um, but now we see, as we talked about, that a lot of superdelegates are, are in essence, pledging early. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that that affects um, voter participation and also mm -hmm. the public opinion, basically? Well, I think, you know, if I look at the number of superdelegates uh, who pledged early, let's say before voters started voting, 
Okay, um, you know, and it seems to me a little more than 100 for Hillary Clinton, 50, 60 right. for other candidates, before anybody said anything in Iowa or New Hampshire. That's not out of ratio with what we've seen in the past. You know, when Mondale ran in 84, we had the House caucus, it was early February, about 70 members of the House said they were for Mondale. But the most of the superdelegates in 1984 and in subsequent years, and, and, and this year as well, really decided later, after most of the voting had occurred. You know, we've already been through most of the primaries already now in this year's nominating process. So the superdelegates tend to move, a group of them move, maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 percent of them move early on because they've got ties, allegiances, whatever reason they have, political calculation, state interest, whatever, they move towards a candidate. Then a group of them begin to move when the voting starts. They make an early decision that someone looks like the nominee, they want to help that ca person's campaign. We've seen that with Senator Kennedy, Senator Kerry, other people early in the process. You know, Senator Bill Nelson for, uh, in Florida for Hillary Clinton. So you have people who decide, listen, I'm going to do this for whatever reason in my state or, you know, because of someone I have a long-term relationship with. But then you have a large group of superdelegates who basically say, you know, I think I'll wait and see what happens here. And I think most of those people have done that. Most of them are still technically on the record, uncommitted. And I think they're waiting to see, you know, perhaps now after Wisconsin and, 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 and what Obama's done winning 10 in a row, some of them are ready. But I think probably most of them are going to say, okay, let's see what happens in Ohio and Texas. If he wins, I think they'll be ready to move. If she wins, I think they may want to wait a little while longer. You said in the New York Times, I read mm -hmm. in your piece, that you, you urged uh, superdelegates to hold yes. off, basically. Yes. Um, and you said basically to prevent the perception that this is an undemocratic system. That's right. Is it? A, I mean, the fact that they do have to hold off, that mm -hmm. there is this conversation going on, mm -hmm. is it a perception or is it reality that it's an undemocratic system? Well, I think, you know, uh, it, I guess it, de it depends on you, how you define democratic. I don't think our system uh, is intended to be a system where all the delegates are picked on, uh, on the basis of the results of the primaries. I think there's a wisdom in it that basically says, listen, we've got a big party here. The most important component of the party in choosing its nominee are the votes, are people who participate in primaries and caucuses. It's a principle which we call fair reflection, which is uh, throughout the charter uh, of the Democratic Party, the rules of the Democratic Party, and the call to the convention itself. So all the documents which control this, our framework, talk about the fair reflection of expressed sentiments of voters who participate. And that is, you know, 80% of what we're talking about. So I don't think having these other people involved in the process necessarily detracts from democracy, just the way that I don't think the fact that we have a bill that passes the House then has to go to a Senate, which is an elected a different way, and then has to be signed into law by an executive who's elected a completely different way, undermines democracy either. You know, we have, we have different checks and balances, we have different mechanisms. I think they're all part of a, you know, democratic institution and, and, a, and a small D and a big D democratic party. So you don't feel that the system is broken or being abused in any way as it is now? Well, I f uh, here's, a, here's the way I feel about judging the nominating process and changing it. I think if you really want to make changes, it's best to wait until after the election. I think the election is a fair and objective standard about the success of the nominating process because if we produce a nominee of great strength who wins an election in November, it's very different than like in 1972 or 1980 or something like that. We produce a nominee where our nominating process undercut them and contributed to the other side's victory. So, so I think if we want to be objective about it, that's what we should do. We should wait. And, and I think, frankly, after you know, 25 years or so, of, you know, it's, it's about time that we step back and, and take another hard look at our nominating process, a serious look. Not the kind of you know, quadrennial look that we've been taking where a bunch of people from the DNC get together, have a little commission, you know, have, have a few people together, but a serious look where we in, in, involve scholars, where we ask people who are objective and not necessarily too partisan within the ranks of potential presidential candidates to offer their testimony, to weigh in, and then to make decisions. But, 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 and I think the most important aspect of this, frankly, is transparency. You know, what I find remarkable now, having 20 years ago been the delegate counter for Mike Dukakis and I sit here today, is when we did it back in the 80s, we were the only people who had this information. No I mean, internet, right? No internet. It sounds strange now, but that's the way we operated. When I first started in 1980, we had this great invention called the fax machine, and we were we were very excited about it. And you know, I don't I think, own one. you know, in '92, as a campaign manager, I had a cell phone. It was as big as a brick. Yeah, you know, that was right. it was incredible. But I think now, when you when I look at it, and I say you can go to a website and you can see all the names of the super delegates, and you know, I I think it's it's a great time. And, and I think what we have to do is, as a party is make sure that we fo are fully participating in that age. And whatever happens this year, 
you know, we've got serious issues. Like, what are we going to do with Michigan and Florida? How are we going to resolve this nomination ultimately? What role properly should the superdelegates play in light of the voting, etc.? That whatever we do, I think it's incumbent on us to do it transparently to make sure that people understand exactly what we're doing, why we're doing it, to have an open and transparent process that we make information available to everyone, principally through the Internet and, and through the media. Um, just to wrap up, I read your paper from 1992 where yes. you essentially predicted this situation that's happening right. today. Um, looking back on that and, you know, uh, the fact that we've ultimately come to this situation, mm -hmm. what do you, what, personally, you know, how does that make you feel? What do you think about that? Well, I was, you know, listen, I was uh, teaching at Boston University at the time, and, and Tony Corrado, who I've known for many years, te you know, is still at Colby College and was teaching there as well. You know, we were, pro you know, uh, approaching this from an academic and not a political perspective. And, and, uh, and, and having done it as an operative, but then stepped back and looked at it as an, you know, and as an academic in those days for me, you know, uh, I wanted to make a statement about what was going to happen and I wanted to do it in hopefully a neutral and unbiased way. And, and I think that kind of advice, frankly, is the type of advice our party should rely on in the future if we change these rules. Try to get people who don't have a stake in it, you know, let them be objective about it, and then on the basis of what you learn and what's happened before, make decisions that benefit the party and hopefully benefit the country. Do you think the same for the voting system as a whole, um, if, if, you know, for the entire American sure. uh, Democratic process? Absolutely. I think we should look at, I mean, listen, I helped to run Al Gore's campaign in 2000, you know, so, you know, did I think the voting system was fair? No, I didn't. I think, you know, whether it was the counting of the votes or, you know, the support that he had that didn't translate into the presidency, I think it was fundamentally unfair. Uh, and, and, I, and I think it's, it would be good for us as a country, and I know some people, very serious people, are now looking at the election system itself. And I, and I think that's a good and healthy thing, and I hope there's more of it, but that it's done not in a partisan way, but in a bipartisan or nonpartisan way. Ted Devine, well, thanks very much. Yeah, great. For NPR Sunday Soapbox, this is Jacob Soberoff. Talk to you guys later.